I'm going to be talking to David Paperno, who is the CFO of Spark Charge, the world's largest EV fleet charging network. And we're going to be talking about the electrification of commercial fleets in the United States, how important that is to American uh, economic competitiveness, and also uh, how fleets are changing and what their infrastructure requirements are going to be like charging. So welcome to the interview, David. Markham, thank you so much. Uh, really excited to chat with you today. It's uh, such an important topic, particularly with all the policy change that we've had here in the United States. Yes, and we're going to get to that um, <laughs> because the the it's I, I we've we've done uh, video news stories on on the policy changes and where President Donald Trump appears to be trying to position the United States with energy dominance in oil and gas and mm -hmm. and. Uh, not he's not a big fan of solar and and wind and you know some of the other uh energy to technologies but outside of north america uh and particularly china europe and, and other asian countries they're electrifying their transportation sectors at a, a really significant rate mm -hmm. and the the reason they're doing that appears to be primarily economic the costs are lower for electric trucks and they're coming down all the time and is that now you talk to uh, fleet owners all the time in the united states mm -hmm. is that widely accepted or widely understood yeah it is i mean you know a couple points on that right when you look at china for example right you know their lead in dominance right is is quite frankly even gaining more momentum um you know, I would say we're, we're probably about five, maybe even 10 years behind where China is on the entire ecosystem. And when I think about the ecosystem, I think about it as it's electric vehicles, but it's also the batteries. It's also the grid. It's also clean energy. It's also solar. Right. I mean, BYD is very commonly known. Right. You know, the price of a BYD, you know, maybe ten thousand dollars. Right. For a really incredible electric vehicle. But it's really all the innovation and ecosystem within that, um, including solar. Right. China really um i think china added uh the same capacity of solar in 2024 than we have here in the us in total right um so that really that you know that edge really can you know kind of continues uh and what we're seeing for sure is the costs are coming down in the us right and the incentives are being you know a little le less relevant uh, because battery costs are come down you know uh, vehicle costs have come down Ford recently announced a $25,000 electric vehicle, right? That's going to roll off production, I think, in 2027. Um, and then when you couple the, these costs that are coming down, right, with the fact that maintenance cost is lower, uh, the ROI is there. So we're already starting to see the ROI now in fleets, right? And that's really driven by the reduction of cost as well as, um, you know, that um, really the lower charging costs and lower maintenance costs. So if I understand this correctly, customers are now asking for electric trucks. Can I electrify my fleet of delivery vehicles? You know, in our neighborhood, we we see Amazon vans running around all, all the time. Uh, and yeah. Amazon, I think, is, is contracted for 100,000 uh, electric vans, if I remember correctly. And so the recognition is there. Is the supply of electric trucks keeping up? Yeah, look, I think the, the demand is there. Um, you know, I think we came from a period of time, you know, two, three years ago, where the industry thought the growth curve was going to be basically a hockey stick, right? And that has normalized. So, you know, we're starting to get out of the period where there is some excess inventory, right? Uh, really for vehicles and for charging, you know, charging systems. So we're moving out of that period. And I think the growth curves have really normalized, right, from that perspective. Um, and, you know, we're still seeing really good growth, right? I mean, GM was up 100% in their vehicle sales, right, year to date, which is pretty incredible. Uh, even the charging systems, right, public charging is up about 23%, right, public DC fast charging in Q2 2025, even with all these uncertainties that we're seeing in policy and, you know, the pause and Debbie, you know, th those types of things. Explain to my viewers how your company helps, uh, you know, truck fleets uh, electrify. What is it that you provide? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And, and it's something that, you know, Josh and Eve and I worked on, you know, really four years ago because we, you know, we looked at the market from a perspective of, you know, how do you accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles to really get these companies to realize their ROI, right? Um, and when you think about infrastructure, we, what we really do is we just take the guesswork of, out, out of all of that, right? Um, and all of the delays that come around it, you know, the wait time for infrastructure, 
you know, the CapEx, uh, significant upfront CapEx, right? Uh, and, you know, the question whether you're going to realize an ROI on that CapEx, right? So we developed, um, you know, it's the world's first and largest off-grid EV charging system, right? EV charging network. Uh, and so we, we can deploy our systems in a little as a week time, right? It's a pay-as-you-go model where you don't have to worry about any of the CapEx, right? And you have the certainty of what you're going to pay. The utilization, you know, you're going to pay for only that utilization that you use. Uh, and then you also have the certainty around, um, you know, around the systems, right? You know, the resiliency that's um, that's not necessarily tied to the grid. It seems to me that uh, energy as a service is becoming a much more common model in the United States. Uh, we have talked to uh, entrepreneurs who are involved in that in in other parts of the of the industry. And it makes a lot of sense because there is a fair amount of uh, uh, capex involved up front, and there's a lot of complexity around building the system, getting permitting, and all of the, the you know the other issues that I mean, truck a, a fleet owner just doesn't want to worry about. They just want to that, you know have, right. they want a turnkey operation and know that it's going to be lower cost than than the diesel that they've been using for decades and decades. So, are you finding that the that business model? Uh, the charging as a service, if you will, uh, is catching on and, and people are beginning, you know, fleet owners are beginning to understand the benefits of it? Yeah, they are. And, um, you know, I think, you know, fleet owners have really, you know, struggled with infrastructure over the years, right? Um, and when they find Spark Charge, we're really alleviating that pain point for them. Um, and I think if you look at the industry, Marco, you know, quite frankly, there's been a lot of consolidation, right? Um, a lot of money floated to the industry three, four years ago. Uh, and there's been a lot of cons consolidation over the years, right? We're very fortunate, quite frankly, that we position Spark Charge to have a much differentiated model. Uh, and in a really challenging time, we, we just announced a $30 million fundraise, right? So that's helping us expand into the United States, uh, you know, throughout the United States, into Canada and into Mexico as well. Right. So we're, you know, we're now in three different countries. And I think that's, you know, that's a, a testament to the model. Right. Um, you know, the demand is there and the demand really wouldn't be there if the, you know, these companies, these fleet operators weren't getting the ROI out of uh, the electric vehicles and the charging systems. Can you tell us a little bit about your operations in Canada? I mean, our Canadian viewership will be very interested. Yeah. In that. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you think about, you know, Spark Charge and, and you know, in general with what we do, right? You think about uh, ride share, autonomous vehicles, right? School buses, ports, uh, really to just name a few of the of the businesses that we touch upon. Uh, and we also work with a lot of, a lot of um, you know, a lot of OEMs, right? Um, you know, a lot, a lot of OEMs, a lot of last mile, you know, delivery type companies. Uh, so very similar business, you know, uh, the business here in the US, business in Canada, very similar mix of those types of companies. A little bit more autonomous vehicles here in the U.S. I think that's just expanding here a little bit more, a little bit more rapidly. Um, but uh, but you know we we think that's going to just continue you know throughout Canada and Mexico as well. Would your markets for uh, for fast charge be in places like Ontario and British Columbia and, and Quebec? And the reason I'm asking is uh, those you know Ontario, uh, sorry, British Columbia and Quebec are leading in EV adoption by a, a large margin. And uh, on the prairies where it gets very cold in the winter, uh, mm -hmm. not not so much. And the larger population centers are also primarily in those uh, three provinces. So is that where we're seeing the, the growth for your company? We're actually re really seeing it um, almost pretty even, you know, throughout each of those countries, right? Canada, U.S., and Mexico. Um, you know, and, and there's a little bit of different use cases, and I can I can explain that as well, right? When you think about um, you know, passenger type vehicles, right? You know, they're you know a little bit more focused around population, urban areas, you know, those types of things. Um, but we also electrify ports, right? Uh, ports, railheads, you know, those types of things, right? So, you know, they can be in, you know, different locations, you know, throughout the country, throughout the country as well. And so, you know, we have a pretty diverse, um, you know, footprint, right? From a perspective of, of what we, you know, what we actively service, and then the really great thing about Spark Charge, quite frankly, is it really takes us a week to set up anywhere, right? So, you know, anywhere in Canada, U.S., Mexico, or even overseas, right, as we look to continue to expand into other countries, the setup time is, is really fast. Um, and um, and so we're able, we're able to really just uh, have a really broad coverage. 
Well, this is interesting that you can set up fast because uh, there are a couple of gas stations in our community uh, that have installed uh, EV chargers and fast is not the way I would describe their construction. <laughs> You know, it's months, in fact, uh, to get them uh, right. get them installed. Um, what describe your system and why you can do it as quickly as you do? Yeah, absolutely. So all of our systems are portable, right? Uh, some of them are modular, meaning that we can connect them together and get more power, get more energy out of them, right? Uh, and with those types of systems, you know, since they're portable, we can take them to where they need to be, right? So you're literally just dealing with the time it takes to transport from one of our warehouses, one of our active locations, to a location, you know, in, in one of these countries. That typically takes two to three days, right? Uh, and then you're dealing with, you know, two, three days of setup uh, to, you know, to get that system up and going. Uh, we primar primarily use battery energy storage systems, right? Um, and, you know, sometimes connected to the grid, sometimes not, right? We're either boosting that energy or we're bringing, bringing that energy in from an offsite location. Typically solar when we do that, right? Um, so, you know, clean, clean energy. And then at times we also use uh, clean microgrids, right? You know, whether it's clean propane, um, clean, you know, hydrogen as an example, one of our customers really likes the, the hydrogen use case. And so, um, and so we're really able to cover um, any type of charging requirement, right? There really isn't, when a customer comes to us and they say, hey, I need charging in this location, we have the solution, right? We haven't been, a, we haven't been in a, a position where we, we've said, hey, we're not actually able to service that use case in an economical way. Can you give me a, a, a case study or two of your customers and what do they look like? Are they long haul trucking firms? Are they last mile firms? Are they, you know, regional hubs? What are they? Yeah, great, great question. And, and it's definitely a mix, right? Um, you know, again, you really think ride share, think autonomous vehicles, right, on the passenger side, as well as rental car, right, car share, rental car, you know, th those types of customers as well. Uh, we actively service ports. We actively actively service long haul, you know, long haul customers, uh, last mile delivery, right? Um, you know, think about box stores, you know, th things along those lines, and um, and I think that again, it just goes to show that you know, number one, electric vehicles, right, are operating in a broad range uh, and providing you know um you know an economical way to electrify fleets across a broad you know a broad set of industries um so we're excited about that right we think it's you know something that's going to continue you know to really expand here throughout throughout all three countries right obviously the u.s is has the highest amount of electric vehicles right now right um but quickly um canada as well as mexico uh, i think mexico's growth rate was about 100 percent last year right so you know they're they're quickly growing their their, their evs as well yeah, I think Canada's, if I remember correctly, was between fifteen and twenty percent, uh, a lower, a lower rate. Um, help, help me understand how what this looks like. So, if you're using batteries, you you come, your your truck pulls up to the site, and it has a battery. Uh, mm -hmm. It has a charging station, obviously, with uh, cables and what have you, and and then you uh, maybe have a uh, you have solar panels, uh, if, mm -hmm. if that's the case, or you would connect that equipment uh to the grid perhaps or a That's microgrid right. as you say so is that the 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 guts of it kind of is is the battery and the and the charging station that's ex that's exactly right that's exactly right and and what we do as well is we provide um you know more of a white glove service as well right so sometimes fleets can actually operate their own vehicles right can charge their own vehicles and operate the charging systems themselves other times they just don't have the people on board to be able to do that, right? So that's one of the one of the added benefits that we provide is, hey, we will actually come and do that that white glove service for you to charge your vehicles and make sure you know they they have a full range and they're ready for that you know for that next trip. Well, in interesting. Um, so where do you see this going in the next uh, two to five years? Because um, we talked about the policy turmoil earlier. And it seems that, you know, a lot of the incentives are being rolled back. Uh, they might be around for another year or two, but they're, they're going to be off the table fairly soon. Is that going to put a crimp in your, uh, in your business or has, your, has EVs, commercial EVs in the United States sort of passed the inflection point where, you know, the, the market can support it? Absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. Right. And, you know, I think anyone in the industry is going to recognize that there's a lot of uncertainty. That's for sure. Right. Particularly on the policy side. 
Um, but quite frankly, what we've seen is that it's not slowing down, right? At least at the moment, uh, which is re- which is really good news. You know, I mentioned some of the stats around GM's growth rates, right? I mentioned some of the stats around, um, you know, public DC fast charging, um, you know, charger installations. You know, this year are up about twenty three percent. Right. And, and that's with, you know, with all of this uncertainty going on. Right. That, you know, that, that we're struggling with. I think what it comes down to, Marco, right, is, you know, EVs are just better vehicles when you cut right through it. Right. And the consumer is adopting them and fleets are adopting them. And if you think about it, why are they doing that? Right. On the on the business side, it's going to be purely I mean, look, from a business perspective, if the ROI is there, companies are going to do it. Right. So we're seeing that, uh, you know, we're seeing that that adoption from that perspective. And on the consumer side, right, when you when you compare, you know, an EV versus an ICE vehicle, I mean, there's tons of information out there around why they're better. Right. And I can mention a couple. Right. Obviously, the acceleration. Right. The lower maintenance costs. You know, if you can charge at home, it's super convenient. Right. I mean, if you're charging at home is, is akin to if you had an ICE vehicle, just getting gas delivered every single day. Right. You have a full tank or full you know, full battery charge every single day. And that's an incredible, you know, incredible convenience. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, I think we're going to continue to see the adoption, right? Um, you know, albeit it's definitely at a lower rate than where we were before, right? Than where folks thought we were, uh, we, we were going. Um, and to me, you know, when you think about, you know, the policy, you know, my perspective here is, um, you know, I think we do need continued policy support to get a faster adoption, right? So I'm not concerned about the adoption itself, I'm more concerned about the pace of the adoption to keep up with some of the competition, particularly in China. Yeah, that that's an issue that's becoming uh, coming more and more to the fore is that China has become kind of the, you know, the the uh, Russia was the uh, uh, the uh, competitor with the United States during the Cold War and China now has kind of emerged at that but a, much more of an economic competitor and the United States is kind of just waking up to how much of a competitor it is and it has right. to do it has to make those changes that are required to remain competitive on a global basis and part of that is electric transportation. David, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. Sounds great, Mark. I appreciate the time. Really, uh, really nice to spend some time with you.